This must be a familiar scene to many of you. A toy electric train being run round a track laid on the lounge carpet. It's fun, but uh, hardly what I would call model railways. There's really no modelling involved. It's only running a toy train. But running on the carpet creates problems which can spoil even this simple fun. Ah, there's a piece of fluff here. That's it, for running on the carpet. Get off, get off. And after the cat, here comes Mum, ready to lay the table for tea. Come on, you want some tea today? She wants to lay the table, all right? Yes. Not all right. I think it did it. Personally, I'm a coffee man myself. And what better use to put a coffee table to than to put a railway under it? Well, Chris Hopkins built this one. Look at it. Lovely open countryside, sheep grazing on the hill, and the road in the cutting down below serving a obviously flourishing community. They're building houses down here. It looks really quite flourishing. And if I take the coffee cup away down here, you can see the harbour. A uh, ship just coming alongside the jetty. And uh, further there is the railway station. And beyond that, the goods yard with the goods waiting to be collected. And then the signal box. And here is the level crossing barrier right down waiting for the train to come. And so let's bring her up, shall we? There she is, coming along here beautifully. Coming along the straight, squealing right over the top curve, past the harbour, thundering over the lifting bridge and into the tunnel. And this time we'll take her into the station. I'll just ease her back a bit. Gently does it. There she goes. Well, if you're one of these railways in the drawing room, then if conversation ever flags, all you've got to do is simply run the train. But not all railways are quite as small as this. In fact, some of them are so large that you've got to run them right outside in the garden. The train you saw running so well on this garden railway is what we call gauge one. Now gauge one is the largest of the model railways, there she is, very large. Now someone who knows a great deal about models is Don Borum. Don, would you like to tell us about the history of the gauges and their development? In the beginning of the development there were three gauges which was one, two and three. And one gauge was not the largest but the smallest of those gauges. The poor man's? The, the poor man's railway in fact. Although it must be admitted that you need an awful lot of equipment and skill to be able to deal with gauge one. I know. Now, as gauges got smaller, the next one down was O gauge. The scale of which is seven millimeters to the foot and the gauge is 32 millimeters. Now this is a very useful gauge because it can be run equally well in steam or electricity or indoors or outdoors. And up to about 1923, there was nothing smaller. What happens next? What happens next was that the o double O gauge was introduced this size. Hold on for a second, I'll put a matchbox in to give you a relative size. Yes, I idea. The scale of that is four millimetres to the foot and the gauge is 16.5 millimetres. It's known as double O. Now the next one below that is HO. HO is 3.5 millimetres to the foot and it's the same gauge, 16.5 millimetres, as double O and it's a much more accurate scale gauge representation. Unfortunately, this gauge is not used in this country, but extensively in, on the continent in America. And the next one down? The next one down is known as TT, and TT stands for tabletop. 
The scale is three millimeters to the foot. The gauge is 12 millimeters. Nowadays, it's more or less of obtainable in kits of parts only, so you have to make your own models. All right, let's go one down. Now, one below that is N gauge. N stands for nine, and it refers to the fact that the track gauge is nine millimeters. The scale is about two millimeters to the foot. That's the one we had on the coffee table. Yes, and it's a very nice line, as you can see. And the next one down is so small that you really need a watchmaker's eyeglass to have a look and at I it. And I have no intention whatever of touching this one. This is Z gauge, the last word, you see. The scale is about 1.5 millimeters to the foot, and the track gauge is 6.5 millimeters. And believe it or not, it's been done in steam. They'll do anything in steam. Indeed they will. Now, now, Don, what is your own personal great love? Well, my own personal preference is for narrow gauge. And here is a model of a, of a locomotive which ran on the Pentium Railway in Cornwall in the 1880s. I put it next to the O-gauge locomotive because these two are of the same scale. It's unbelievable. So it isn't, really. And a little man standing on the footplate there would be perfectly compatible with a little man standing on the footplate there because they're the same scale. But the track's very different, isn't it? The track gauge is not the same, of course, because this is a narrow gauge locomotive. The track gauge of this 16.5 millimeters is the same as that. And there the resemblance ends because the sleeper spacing and sizes are compatible with these here. What else comes out of your stable, Don? Well, there's one oddity in that the Listowel and Ballybunion Railway in Ireland was a monorail, and my friends always refer to this as the no gauge. You see, it runs on one single rail, which is even narrower, of course, than Z gauge, the other two being merely for uh, purposes of stabilization. You've got to be fairly nutty to make one of those. Oh, you have, but fortunately I am, so that's all right. Now, Don, seriously, what sort of advice would you give a beginner? Well, first of all, of course, join a club, because in a club you can get all the help, assistance, advice that you need. Apart from that, I suggest that the beginners should try their hand at 4mm scale modelling 00, because completed models are available, also parts. Very easy. And what happens if he hasn't got enough space for Well, that? in that case, I suggest he tries N-gauge, because, again, completed models and also a certain amount of parts are available, and, of course, it is the scenic maker's paradise. Well, model railways don't just consist of locomotives, so let's take a look at a couple of working layouts. Let's start with one that's been run at a club meeting. This layout is approximately 20 foot long and 2 foot wide and is in double O gauge. It represents a sleepy West Country branch line and was built by members of the Twickenham Model Railway Club. The interesting thing about this layout is that it gives you the real atmosphere of a West Country branch line. Even the coal wagons have the right feel about them. And there's a nice touch with a shepherd tending his flock of sheep. And the barn with the figures and the horse help to complete the rural scene. There's even a fallen tree lying in a pond. And here comes the goods train, just about to cross the river. The loco on the passenger train is uncoupled and will eventually go to the shed for servicing. And here is a fresh loco for the return journey.
Not everyone is satisfied with only running on a club layout. Many modelers also like to have a layout in their own home. And where better to have one than in the garage? After all, isn't this what garages are for? This is an HO Continental layout built by John Christie, and it includes overhead traction wires. Even the pantograph looks realistic. And you can tell it's a Continental layout from the signs on the goods train. Here are some more clues. many people realize that if you build a full-scale model of Waterloo Station in double O gauge, you need, believe it or not, the size of one tennis court. And that's why many people build their models in a smaller gauge. Now, this particular model is built in N gauge by Bert White and his friends of Bristol East Model Railway Club. Now, Bert, why did you particularly choose N gauge? Well, first thing, Bob, we were limited by the size of room we had available. We had intended building a double O layout but N-Gage proved the satisfactory answer to our problem. So you settled for that? Yes, we did. Well, let's go and have a look down the line. Let's start with the quarry up there. That's a proper quarry with a railway siding to it. You've got an elevator leading right down onto the working face. And at the bottom, you've got a small miniature railway with bad track as the prototype. Let's walk down the railway. What have we got there? Oh, it looks wet and dirty. Well, that is a pool which we produced by clear casting resin, coloured at various stages. It looks really dirty and it's almost smelly. What have you got in there? Well, that's an old railway wagon that uh, was pushed off by vandals. Oh, what a horrid habit. Well, talking about water, let's have a look at your stream. It looks beautifully clean and fresh. Done the same way, is it? Yes, that's done the same way, colouring at various levels. And having a stream there with obviously fish in it and everything else, have you got a mill? Yes, the mill no longer working, I'm afraid. Now, old Mr Hobbs passed away a few days ago. I see you have some sheep in the pen in your goods yard. They've yeah. been recently sold, have they? Yes, Quibble and Cuss, the auctioneers, sold them to the local abattoir. And they're still shipping them by train? To the local town. Oh, that's rather nice. And uh, let's walk down then from the goods yard across the level crossing into the forecourt of the station. It's a nice wide open station and at right angle to the station you've got three houses. They're rather nice houses. Who lives there? Railway men. You can tell that by the well-tended back gardens. Oh yes, they do look nice and they have the washing out. They don't mind the smuts, do they? No, not at all. Oh, that doesn't. That's very nice indeed. Now along the railway line next to the station you've got Hobbs. It says Hobbs Flower and Hobbs Transport. What is that? Why is that? Well, it's now been taken over by the son of Hobbs, the, the miller, mm -hmm. as a transport business. He's got a good position for that there. And right behind Hobbs is, of course, is the church. Nice four-square tower, beautifully tended graveyard. And I see the gravedigger is digging away there. Uh, you've had a recent bereavement. Yes, Mr. Hobbs, the miller. Oh, that's sad. But I presume his son is carrying on the business. Yes, he is indeed. Well, what other um, industry have you got in the village? We have a timber yard just up the line. Oh, yes, and a railway siding naturally leading to it, which is how it ought to be. And the front of the building has the name and the telephone number for the railway passengers to see as they go by. And what's, what's happening further up the line? Further up, we have the remains of a hill fort. And just further on again, we have five druid stones. Ah, and the railway itself disappears in a tunnel underneath the hill. 
Well, I think it's about time to run a train. I say, Bert, that is an absolutely lovely run, really perfect. Tell me, how did you base all these buildings? What did you base them on? Well, Bob, my son went out with his camera round and about Bristol and photographed lots of cottages and other buildings. And we very loosely based our models on these. But did you uh, build correct copies of them? Not precise copies, no. In fact, uh, we incorporated one or two photographs into one building. And. Uh, when, you, when we talked about this place, it seemed to have real live people in it. Yes, over the course of building, we have in fact built up a real living community. Now, if you're planning to build a model railway, then I personally think it's probably better to base at least part of it on some existing line or station. Now, in our next program, we're going to show you how to build a model railway from scratch. So let's end this one by showing you how we did our preliminary research. Now, for this particular exercise, we picked Horsted Keene Station on the Bluebell Railway in Sussex. Well, here we are, ready for the occasion, dressed for the fray, permitted permission to work here, fitted out with map, paper, and, of course, the camera, which is, and believe it or not, that is the camera, and naturally, we tape measure to measure the distances and heights and everything else we can do. So, let's get going and see what it looks like. This is the old main line connecting uh, East Grinstead here in front of us to Haywards Heath right behind us. And uh, this line, of course, has been lifted some time ago, but for the sake of our model railway, we want to set it up again and run it. And here, going right to uh, down here, down to Lewis, is the branch line. And the branch line, of course, is the line which has now been operated by the Bluebell Society as a working railway. Now, the reason why we want to model this layout here is because it's a typical junction between a branch line, a nice little wandering country branch line, and a main line. And also it has what I would call a very nice railway station. So let's go and have a look at it. Well, there it is, a pretty little station built at the turn of the century, exactly the sort of mid-Victorian architecture and country charm that we would like to model. And it is the sort of station which has both. It has the rural atmosphere that you want for a rural junction, a sleepy rural junction, it's got the main line, it's got the other advantage, it's got four platforms, one, two, three, four, and it's got underpasses at the back there, which give you the benefit of all the modelling tricks you'd like to incorporate it. But before you do anything else, the first thing we've got to do is to sit down or ma make a note of all the track diagram. Now, the way to do it is either you walk along and make a close note of all the points, all the turnouts, all the little stub sidings, or, if you're lucky, you can get into the signal box and get a layout of the track diagram there. Now, if you want to model a signal box, and uh, this sort of signal box like this is very, very important, the ideal way to go about it is to have a proper engineering drawing of it. But that isn't always possible. And so the answer is to take a photograph. But it's very important to remember that the sort of photograph you're going to take is not the type of photograph you might like for your collection in, in the album. Down here, a sort of shot like this. Well, that's very pretty, but it certainly won't give you the records you want. What you really want is to take the photograph square on, absolutely square. You look at it like this. The bricks, in fact, the bricks themselves are virtually your scale, so you can read the size of the box off from the bricks. So camera straight, nice and straight, eye level straight, and adjust it. So here you are with a photograph of the actual signal box. It's almost as good as an engineering drawing.
And of course, we didn't forget to sketch some of the finer details of the canopies and canopy supports which make the station. and it pays to make a careful note of the vital measurements. Now, that is a very typical water tower setup, the sort of setup you get in all branch line stations and all junctions. Here you've got an engine house, you've got a water tower, or the water tower plinth, the water tower has been taken off, of course, it's, there must have been a metal water tower on top, which we'll have to rebuild. But Basically, it's so typical of a junction where locomotives take water that unless we build this type of thing, you're missing half the atmosphere, and this is very, very important. Of course, you can do all sorts of funny things like measuring up these lovely old York stones. Now, they make a good... They're not always the same, so you might as well look how wide they are. This is 3 foot 11. It's not 4 foot. And uh, that's worth remembering and noting. And, of course, finally, let's have a look at this sort of thing, this very beautiful cast iron Victoriana. That can be repeated quite easily. All you've got to do, uh, an upright, a bit of fuse wire, sold it up and paint it, and that gives it the style and the character you need to make this a real model, not a toy. Thank you.